Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Imperial Mining webinar. Thank you for joining us today. It's actually not even a webinar. That's something that Peter Cashin called um, Open Forum. I think this is the first time that we're doing something like this. Uh, and it's, it has not just President and CEO Peter Cashin, but also other members of the Imperial team. And we will be able to touch upon multiple topics, all things related to Scandium, obviously what Scandium is, um, its capabilities, the global market, and of course, Imperial Mining itself and its Creator Lake project. Um, before we dive into the actual presentation and discussion, I'll just go over a couple of formal formalities. Uh, first of all, on your um, screen, you would see the last icon on your right, and that is the handouts icon. If you click on it, you will actually see a couple of documents that are downloadable. So anybody who wants to have a look at the older Q&As that we did, frequently asked questions, fact sheet, as well as the current presentation that will be shown during the event, you can download it throughout the event. It's available. Um, and um, also we encourage questions from the audience that will be answered during the live session at the end of the formal part. And you would see it on your panel that says questions and answers. Uh, there is also a chat box, but that's more for informal communication. Um, I will be monitoring that box as well, but we, we kindly ask you to uh, send your questions to the Q questions and answers box that, that is, uh, we give preference to that one. And uh, without much further ado, I'll give the floor to uh, Peter Cashin, who will introduce the team and um, the flow of the event. Good luck. Uh, thank you, Irina, and good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us at uh, this afternoon's uh, webinar. As Irina outlined to you, I think it'd be, uh, there have been many questions from us exactly what the status of the project is, uh, more the work that's been done, and more particularly where we're headed going forward. So with that in mind, I've, I've made available uh, the full uh, operation, operating uh, team at Quest that will cover off on all aspects of the project from uh, strategic marketing, the geology, metallurgy, and then ultimately what our, what our uh, intentions are going forward in the development of the Strange Lake or uh, Cradle Lake uh, Scandium project. Um, uh, our disclaimer statement. So as I outlined to you, we, I'm going to briefly outline to you our uh, business strategy. Uh, I'll pass the baton off to Phil uh, Chatignot, who's our uh, manager of strategic uh, marketing, uh, run through the he'll run through the dynamics of uh, and the significance of the Scandium market, as well as uh, how critical it will be to Quebec. Uh, from that, I'll, I'll, uh, Phil will pass on to Pierre Gay, uh, our VP of Exploration, will uh, give a detailed description of the Scandium Rare Earth project, the Crater Lake project, and it's uh, our intentions going forward. Uh, finally, we'll uh, take a look. Uh, uh, Pierre will introduce Dr. Yemioi Darren, who's been working on the metallurgy, the metallurgical uh, solution for the uh, Strange Lake uh, Crater Lake, uh, or sorry about the uh, Strange Lake. And finally, we'll take we'll take a look at the objectives of uh, our intentions going forward of, of establishing a supply chain in Scandium in North America. So, really, our focus is the development of the Crater Lake Scandium Rare Earth Project. We view it as a pathway to near-term sustainable cash generation. Uh, to date, we estimate that the capex the, uh, and the operating expense, as well as the nature of the process uh, method to recover the scandium will be uh, quite simple. Uh, our intention is to move the development of the project to cr the creation of scandium aluminum master alloy, um, mostly applied to the automotive, aerospace and defense sectors. Um, because of our price, uh, the nature of our operation being an open pit, uh, we intend to be the price disruptor for Scandium uh, in the market. And of course, we're located in Quebec, which is the capital of aluminum in Canada. So uh, um, what is uh, Scandium? And most of you may very well know, it's a hardener and strengthener of conventional al aluminum alloys. It, uh, it renders them heat and corrosion resistant. It really has applications to light weighting of most uh, manufactured platforms, <clears throat> more notably automotive, aerospace, fuel cell and defense sectors. 
it has the direct impact of reducing carbon footprint, uh, particularly in the area of uh, commercial aircraft and e electric vehicles, as well as reducing the reduction of emissions of, uh, of uh, combustion engines. And then, of course, EVs, the intention really is light weighting of the platform enhances uh, the range of the, of the platform. The issue has always been is, is the sustainability of, of the material, given that Russia and China are the principal suppliers. And as a result of this constrained supply chain, uh, prices have been uh, so very high that it's, it's forced manufacturers to seek uh, alternative materials for light weighting. We believe that uh, from our work that uh, at a price of between $1,250 and $1,500 per kilogram for scandium oxide, it would enhance uh, and drive consumption growth. So uh, Imperial compared to our peers, which are generally mostly Australians, uh, figures extremely well in terms of market capitalization, uh, shares of uh, outstanding shares, uh, and given the nature of our deposit, as we'll describe for you, uh, we are very uh, competitive and compare very favorably with early develop as an early development play uh, against our more advanced peers illustrated here for you. Um, so before I lead into Phil, this, this is in essence what Scandium does for you in very, very small proportions and 0.4% addition has a significant impact on the strengthening of conventional alloys. And as I outlined to you, the two areas uh, that we're trying to focus on right now is aerospace and defense. And I, we believe that the automotive sector uh, is uh, will be uh, a late adopter because their price margins are quite a bit tighter than the other, other industries. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the baton on to Phil, Phil Chateno, our manager of strategic marketing. Phil, go ahead. Thank you. Moving on, I'd just like to talk about a couple of the major markets that we've been looking at. Um, this is going to help us with the de demand and pull dynamic. And as Peter was saying, uh, what's really driving all of this is what Scandium can do for these applications. The universal factor amongst all the things I'm going to talk about is the lowering of the weight, which is gonna improve performance. It's actually gonna be more cost effective. It's going to be um, cheaper, say, to fly an aircraft or power a vehicle. So let's look at this first slide together. Um, this is a graph and projection of what's happening in the automotive space. And there's gonna be two main applications here. You're gonna have a lot of applications in EVs. A critical one is forthcoming in a slide. But this one really speaks to the powertrain, which is the only spot left in internal combustion engines that really has significant light weighting to undergo for the next few decades. As countries around the world transition to a low carbon economy, internal combustion engines will be made increasingly efficient and then phased out. So there's gonna be a very large role for Scandium to play in this market. Moving on, something that is brand new. There we go, there we go. Something that, um, pardon me, uh, let me just touch on aircraft for a moment. Uh, there's a very detailed uh, slide here that I'd like to have everyone see, but maybe a key metric that I can share with you is this. For every single kilogram of weight that you save in an aircraft, it's going to save 8.6 tons of carbon dioxide over the lifetime of that aircraft. This is going to become an increasingly important metric, not to mention the fuel savings that are already inherent in all of this. And because we can supply the market at scale, geopolitically stable with the price advantage that uh, Mr. Cashin spoke of earlier, this is giving us a very large um, introduction into the aerospace world. The most important thing about this particular segment, and this applies for defense as well, is that it is relatively price insensitive. This area, defense and aerospace, pays for performance because it's very easy uh, on the economics and it's something that they want to adopt. In terms of a new disruptive technology, I'd like to move on to the offshore wind turbine market. Many of you have probably heard of this in the news for quite some time. Uh, we at Imperial have been working on this since last year, and there are two main applications in the offshore wind turbine market. Internally on the nacelle, the 12 megawatt version, which you see pictured here, weighs about 600 metric tons. It is huge, it's very heavy. 
And because it sits so far above the surface of the ocean, you want to make this as lightweight and corrosion resistant as possible because you want to bring down the center of gravity. The other major application wind turbines are going to be on the blades themselves. These are actually wings. Essentially, they work the same way as you would find on a jet fighter or a commercial airliner, except they're pointed in a different direction. The leading edge and the tips are where you're going to have the initial aluminum scanium applications. And General Electric has already started to experiment with 3D printing for aluminum for that specific reason. Moving forward, this is probably the most important application for EVs. And it's one that's probably going to be surprising to a lot of people. And that is for the electric traction motors. By using scandium and aluminum together, you can make aluminum wire as strong as copper wire. Why is this important? Because you cannot go into the automotive sector and disrupt practices and processes because they're in place and the capital costs have already been appreciated and spread out. By making sure that the aluminum wire is as strong as copper, you're basically delivering something that saves more than a third of the weight and is approximately 80% lower in cost. This is something that's gonna immediately have a benefit to the sticker price of the car, but also for the range that you would get for an electric battery vehicle. Lastly, I would like to talk about the benefits of the Quebec aluminum sector. As Mr. Cashin mentioned, it is a center of excellence around the world. It is the lowest uh, carbon footprint producing sector anywhere in the world is amongst the lowest in cost. Combine this with the multitude of benefits that the Quebec government is putting in place around aluminum and advanced critical materials. You see here, there's the perfect business environment to build the synergy, not only to bring Crater Lake and Scandium production forward, but to increase the entire aluminum sector as well. And with that, I'd like to introduce everyone to Monsieur Gay, our VP of Exploration. Thanks, Will. So, uh, next uh, slide. So, the uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, the uh, Crater Lake uh, Scandium uh, Rare Earth Element Project, 100% uh, owned by uh, Imperial Mining Group, so is uh, located uh, 1,300 uh, kilometers uh, north from uh, Montreal, Quebec and uh, 200 kilometers uh, east from Chefferville, Quebec, and 200 kilometers north from uh, Churchill Falls in uh, Labrador. So actually, so the project, uh, you know, can be uh, is shown here. So by the light blue uh, uh, star, like in the uh, upper right uh, corner so of the figure. So the uh, project is entirely uh, located in the uh, Quebec province. And the access to the project is only done, you know, by plane or uh, helicopter. So there's uh, an existing uh, 4,000 feet or 1.2 uh, kilometer long uh, gravel airstrip uh, located 45 kilometers uh, east uh, of the project. So what also you can see on the figure that the, uh, the Crater Lake project is located, uh, located uh, near like a major like uh, uh, aluminum uh, plants, like the aluminum plant in uh, Settil, uh, Bekamo, uh, Sagney, and also uh, Bekanko. And uh, there's also other like uh, existing infrastructures, you know, like uh, a railroad, you know, going from uh, Shefferville to uh, Settil. There's also a major road going from Churchill Falls uh, down to uh, Bekabo. And also there's uh, excellent, I mean, like uh, hydroelectric capacity as the uh, Churchill Falls uh, hydroelectric uh, uh, plan located uh, 200 kilometer, kilometers uh, you know, south of the uh, Crater Lake uh, project. So uh, due to its uh, location, the uh, Crater Lake projects uh, can be supported by the uh, Quebec government uh, plan or program, and as well also by some uh, new uh, development funds, you know, uh, for uh, critical uh, minerals uh, research and development. Uh, next uh, slide. So, as I mentioned, I mean, one of the uh, existing infrastructure so is the uh, Border Beacon Airstrip located uh, 45 kilometers uh, east from Crater Lake. Uh, so here, so you can see the uh, yellow line correspond to a proposed, uh, you know, gravel road that we uh, would build, you know, to support the, uh, the project. And by using this uh, existing airstrip, so we believe that we could actually uh, reduce the, our infrastructure uh, cost by uh, two-thirds. So the uh, 
55 kilometers long, like, I mean, all season gravel uh, roads, so, uh, you know, could actually can be uh, built to access the, uh, both uh, locations. So next uh, slide. So this is actually, this slide uh, shows the uh, regional geology. The uh, Crater Lake, uh, you know, project is located within the uh, Churchill uh, Geological Province. Uh, this is uh, shown, you know, in uh, with the light uh, yellow uh, color, so you know, uh, with the uh, the figure so on your uh, on your right. Uh, the the rocks uh, consist of the uh, of a volcano sedimentary package, uh, which is uh, uh, intruded by several like a large uh, you know plutons that are shown like in the uh, light gray uh, uh, color. So uh, the uh, Crater Lake uh, cyanide intrusion uh, consists of a six kilometers uh, diameter intrusion, intruding the uh, Mistastin uh, granitic uh, batholith that you can see so uh, on the right side. So uh, now, if you look at the uh, smaller, uh, actually figure to the left, uh, this is a, a magnetic uh, map coming from the uh, Geological Survey of Canada. And here, so you can see the uh, uh, Crater Lake uh, intrusion within the uh, uh, the uh, orange uh, circle. So uh, it shows also like, you know, uh, a series of uh, concentric magnetic rings near uh, its contact with the Mistastin granitic pluton. So these uh, concentric uh, magnetic rings uh, are the host of the uh, scandium plus uh, re-burying ferrocyanide units. All the scandium re-burying ferrocyanides uh, are strongly magnetic and can be detected by, you know, uh, using a specific uh, geophysical uh, exploration tool. Next uh, slide. So uh, this is uh, actually the, uh, the bottom left uh, figure shows uh, a 3D inversion model of the uh, magnetics uh, within the uh, Crater Lake uh, intrusion. So the, the magenta uh, colored uh, zone correspond to a highly magnetic zone, potentially hosting scandium plus remineralized ferrocyanides. So scandium plus three wide mineralized zones, I mean, were found so far, you know, at the um, Border Lake uh, zone, the TGZ target and the STG target. These magnetic highs, I mean, rings uh, are deeply uh, uh, rooted and appears to be uh, wider, so at depth, suggesting that the uh, scandium plus three mineralized uh, ferrocyanide units came up through uh, concentric and radial structures like faults, probably caused by the collapsing of the uh, Crater Lake uh, cyanide intrusion. So far, like exploration results so have returned like uh, excellent scandium grades, you know, from drill core, from grab samples, from channel uh, samples ranging from 260 to 2,500 uh, grams per ton of oxide scandium. As well, so uh, during our exploration program, so we found also a niobium plus tantalum anomalous zone uh, with very good, uh, I mean, uh, niobium oxide grade you know, up to 9% and also 3,000 ppm tantalum in grab samples. Of course, I mean, more exploration will be conducted on this zone uh, this uh, summer. Next uh, slide. So uh, this uh, figure uh, shows a uh, more detail, more details about the uh, the magnetics and the geology of the western and northern portions of the Crater Lake intrusion. So during the summer 2020, so we uh, actually uh, conducted a detailed ground max survey, and these areas actually so are shown in red here, so on the figure. And we've done that survey, I mean, in a matter to better trace and define the magnetic highs, which correspond to the scandium re-mineralized uh, ferrocyanide. So prospecting, geological mapping and reading, so were conducted on different magnetic high targets, like you know, uh, the northern target to the north, the TGZ target, the hilltop target, and the STG target. So far, you know, the TGZ target, I mean, shows the best potential to host uh, a scandium plus three uh, open pit deposit. Therefore, so, I mean, Imperial decided to, uh, you know, perform a definition drilling program at TGZ to define a 8 to 10 million tons uh, scandium re mineral resource in 2021. Next uh, slide. Uh, 
This actually slides uh, shows, I mean, the northern half of the magnetic high of the TGZ target. Uh, this is uh, shown in purple uh, color here. So, so, uh, so far, I mean, all the drill holes, I mean, were drilled, uh, you know, uh, uh, within like a, a 50 meter spaced uh, grid. So you can see, I mean, the color dots here correspond to the location of the drill holes. So, and, you know, in during winter 2021, we drilled 14 uh, drill holes. And now we are currently uh, doing a Scandium re, uh, resource estimate using a total of uh, 18 diamond drill holes and results uh, of this uh, mineral resource uh, are, I mean, expected by the end of July and early uh, August. So, uh, of course, I mean, you know, we also collected, I mean, some uh, metallurgical uh, samples, you know, and Yemi or Yidoran, so we'll talk uh, to you uh, with more details uh, later on. So. Now, so uh, I just want to show you a series of uh, uh, interpreted uh, cross sections of the of the deposit. So I want you to pay attention on the on the light blue color here. So I mean, this is the scandium plus three uh, bearing of ferrocyanide. So and what it shows actually on uh, I mean on the next couple of sections, you're going to see I mean the zone I mean come right to the surface and is still open at depth. And the zone is quite wide, you know, it varies, like I said, you know, from 50 meters to uh, up to 135 meters in true width. And on this, uh, on one section, like, uh, I mean, you can see it looks like a cone shape. So, and it's, you know, and we see improvement with the scansium grade and the width at depth. So now, so what's next, uh, you know, for the, uh, you know, uh, next uh, slide, please. So what's, uh, you know, next for the remaining of 2021? First, we want to collect a 50 tons uh, bulk sample of the mineralization. We want also to conduct more drilling at TGZ to confirm the scandium grade increase at depth and the thickening of the zone. And as well, we want to conduct more drilling so on the uh, other magnetic high targets. So we also intend to uh, do more prospecting, mapping sort of STG and follow up also on the niobium tantalum mineral occurrence. And finally, so uh, imp with, uh, at Imperial, so uh, we intend to produce a preliminary economic assessment with results to be known in early fall 2021. So the proposed budget for this summer is of uh, $2 million. Now, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Yemi uh, Oyediran, the Imperial Manager of Metallurgical Development. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pierre, and uh, good day, everyone, uh, wherever you're dialing in today. Um, <clears throat> before going into the slide, I want to stress the fact that Imperial has actually taken a very unique approach in developing the Crater Lake project in that for most of the um, base and pressure metal projects, uh, people will first uh, establish a resource before ever thinking of ever doing any metallurgy on them. But we have taken a unique approach in doing a lot of these aspects of the project development at the same time, simultaneously. And this has helped each of the teams because whatever we find in the metallurgy, we transfer that to the geologists and they try to see how best they could use that information to look for a better solution uh, in the field. And vice versa, whatever they see in the field, they let us know. Um, in terms of the metallurgical development, I think uh, we've made significant strides in the development of uh, a processing flow sheet for the extraction of scandium and the contained rare earths in the mineralization. Um, <clears throat> as Pierre uh, has alluded to, the, the scandium bearing minerals are quite magnetic and we have capitalized on this specific property uh, in using magnetic separation techniques uh, to recover about 96% of scandium and about 74% of the rare earths into a 50 to 60% mineral concentrate, which feeds into a hydrometallurgical uh, processing step. Uh, we tested flotation as well and some other mineral processing techniques. Uh, flotation 
showed remarkably good recoveries and mass rejection of gang minerals as well. But we've decided that uh, for this particular project and for this type of mineralization, um, magnetic separation offers the best opportunity for preconcentration. And because of its simplicity and because of its effectiveness, uh, we think we're able to save on cost in terms of operating cost and as well as capital expenditure. Um, all sorting uh, looks promising as a preconcentration step to remove some of the gang materials before we go into milling. This will save us uh, milling cost, and uh, we're looking at and we're looking at including sensor or sorting in the flow sheet as well. I'm going to move to the next slide. So um, we generated and um, a mineral concentrate. The mineral concentrate now goes into uh, the hydromet portion of things. We're looking at two different approaches uh, for the digestion of the scandium and the rare earth into a primary leach solution. Uh, we're looking at uh, a pure hydromet approach and we're looking at um, a pyrometallurgical approach as well. We have just developed a new uh, patentable hydrometallurgical digestion method for extracting scandium and the rare earths into the primary lead solution. Uh, we're in the process of patenting uh, this method and the method has offered us a uh, recovery in the range of um, 85 to 87%. Uh, for scandium and about 85% uh, for, for the rare arts. Um, a pyrometallurgical method is being developed on a parallel path, and that pyrometallurgical me method uh, looks like what's being used in the titanium industry. Um, we think uh, th that method uh, is being successful as well because we're able to produce very clean PLS that's the primary list solution. And we're able to see a remarkable separation of scandium from the rare arts and the impurities from both payable meta streams, which is quite uh, significant. So moving forward, one of these options will make the, the flow sheet, but I think uh, we're at this stage now where we have to look under each stone. We will not leave any stone unturned. Uh, we will look at all the options and then make the best decision um, for the program, for the project. So I'm just going to go to the next slide. Um, so uh, moving forward, we, we have a 100 kilogram of mineral concentrate on hand and we're going to uh, campaign this concentrate through hydromet digestion uh, to generate a bulk primary list solution. And that bulk primary list solution will be the primary feed for the evaluation of ion exchange or solvent extraction technologies um, for the recovery of the payable metals. The ultimate goal of the metallurgical and engineering portion of this is that we want to be able to produce a scandium oxide that will be suitable for the production of 2% aluminum scandium master alloy. And we want to be able to recover the rare earths as a bulk uh, carbonate, which will be suitable for uh, further separation in a, in a separation plan, probably through a, a tolling processing arrangement. Um, so essentially, that's, uh, that's where we are. Uh, did I skip one slide? I think so. Okay, just give me a minute. So, um, we are looking at uh, starting a pilot program by Q4 of the year. Uh, Pierre mentioned that uh, 50 tons of sample will be generated, will be collected from the, from the mine site uh, this summer. As soon as we get the sample, we're looking at going into piloting of that 50 uh, tons materials through the entire flow sheet. And um, 
hopefully by this time of uh, next year or closer to Q4 of next year, we will be completing the full piloting of the project. Um, that's all I've got. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Yemi. Um, I'll, I'll take over now. And so in essence, I in my introduction, I said that our intention is to develop a scandium supply chain in North America to service the industries. So ultimately, uh, we're uh, in, in the blue circle. We're undertaking all of the development steps required to move the project to feasibility and ultimately to a, a production decision. Um, part of uh, what Phil is doing is uh, establishing strategic material and platform R&D alliances with industry and academia. Uh, the intent there is to produce uh, new saleable uh, aluminum alloy compositions, as well as new applications uh, for the use of those materials. So in other words, we are developing uh, market pull, establishing market pull with those efforts. And uh, for those that are aware, uh, Rio Tinto made an announcement in May of 2020 of going forward with uh, recovering Scandium as a byproduct from their uh, Tatium operations in Quebec. Uh, and they've already sold their first aliquot of material. So uh, it's one of those, if you will build it, they will come scenarios. Obviously, they had no difficulty selling the first uh, allocation of their product. Uh, so it's been very helpful to us. Uh, I had outlined that to make market uh, and to make it attractive for global industries is we to produce at a price point where uh, the use of scandium will become a, uh, will be fairly commonplace. Um, we are obviously in Canada, we're right next door to a very important uh, uh, marketing and uh, sales partner in the United States. So certainly in Canada, we're able to portray ourselves as a very reliable, di diversified supply chain with the necessary infrastructure to, de be, to deliver a reliable product. Ultimately, uh, uh, down the road, once uh, Scandium Aluminum gets into the market and becomes more commonplace, uh, we are looking at the development of a recycling plan whereby uh, using blockchain and digital tagging technology, we ensure quality assurance of the material that comes back that we recycle. So ultimately, we're, from all of these steps and efforts, uh, we're, we're certainly able to portray uh, the development of a circular economy, which is uh, extremely supported uh, by the Quebec government. So what are the uh, opportunities to investors? Um, we're portraying, uh, Pierre portrayed that we're, uh, we're establishing a large high-grade surface uh, resource in Scandium and rare earths. It comes to surface, it'll be open pitable. Uh, the requirements for uh, delivery of minimum 100 tons of scandium oxide uh, to world markets is approximately 400,000 tons of open pit mining, which is very, very small operating footprint and environmental footprint. The mineralization is, uh, we're, we're able to recover the material of, of the pay materials with uh, simple metallurgical steps. Um, the advantage of our mineralization in addition is that the very, very low uh, uranium and thorium counts related to the mineralization. So we're able to mitigate the environmental uh, impacts of, of uh, the material that uh, gets mined on, at the operation. Our, our, our overhead costs and projected expenses are considered to be at the low uh, end of uh, the cost profile. Uh, certainly we're able to provide material that's near the dipping point of broader consumption use at $1,250 or $1,500 US per kilogram. We're in Quebec, very mining friendly. We have a very strong relationship with local indigenous communities. We've got a management and board, as, as uh, was portrayed to you, uh, that's very, very comfortable with the critical metal space, uh, as well as the, the development. We have the development expertise to bring those, uh, those projects to fruition. And uh, we're already in the process of undertaking the material R&D uh, to enhance market pull by the creation of new alloys and new applications. And obviously, with the uh, U.S. trade, U.S. China trade war, and uh, the, the threat of U.S. export restrictions on things like rare earths, um, the, in, in our view, that the global supply chain model is is somewhat failed, and the the likelihood is we're moving towards the establishment of local or continental supply chains, of which we would be considered part of that uh, formula. 
So with that, I'd like to thank you very much, and we're more than happy to open the table the uh, the table to questions and answers. Hi everybody again. I see there is a lot of questions. So obviously, half of the people ignored my request to add it to the Q and A section, and it's all over the place, including my email. Uh, but luckily, I predicted that. So I'm I'm just gonna try to combine some of them because a lot of them are divided. I would say into topics. So I think we'll have enough questions to for everybody. Um, and uh, I think we'll start with this. And we've received, Peter would remember, we've received this question in the past. Do grades matter when it comes to Scandium? What is the benchmark to know if the grades are good or not? You know, for example, like with gold, you know, or, or copper, everybody's kind of aware of what's good and what's average. Uh, what about Scandium? <clears throat> Well, scandium, first of all, as as is the case of all of the critical materials, is uh, not a market tradable commodity. It's not an L LMA listed. It's um, it's uh, usually sold on on off take agreements and secret sales contracts. Uh, so the the comparison with conventional metals can cannot be made. Uh, that being said, uh, knowing what it's it's so what we've had to do on our strategic marketing is is gauge what the price sensitivity of of consuming industries is. And that twelve fifty to fifteen hundred dollar per kilogram mark is probably what will drive success on this project. Uh, in terms of actual scandium grade within a, a given project, uh, two hundred ppm scandium or 002 percent scandium is considered economic threshold. And as uh, Pierre portrayed to you earlier. Uh, our grades in the order of 300 to 350, so well above the threshold, providing us with a potential of excellent margins. That's great. Okay, um, that's probably going to be a question for Pierre, actually. Uh, what would be a preferable drilling density to give confidence on the resource reserve base? Uh, actually, so the uh, drilling that we've conducted you know with uh, 50 uh, meters uh, spacing so uh, you know we uh, believe so that uh, we should uh, probably get into the uh, indicated uh, resource category so uh, first you know uh, we wanted to go I mean with the wider spacing maybe uh, 75 meters 100 meters and maybe fall under the uh, infrared category you know uh, in terms of resource uh, but now, so we believe we can get maybe uh, into the uh, indicated. So that I mean, that's what we are hoping. So with the, uh, the our current uh, you know contractor doing the uh, the resource estimate. So and if we do fall under the indicated, I mean, good because we can keep I mean like uh, drilling at the, you know at the 50 meter spacing, and we can actually uh, use the you know those uh, indicated resource you know uh, uh, to bring that into uh, the. Uh, uh, pre uh, feasibility study or a feasibility study. Great. I think that will be a follow up question to you as well. Have you given consideration for membrane metallurgy for separation for these types of deposits? Or that's for Yemi, actually. I think. What, what's that question again? Have you given consideration for membrane metallurgy for separation for these types of deposits? Oh, membrane metallurgy. Okay. Um, sure. I mean, we we are at the stage now where we're, we're looking at uh, the technologies that can help us to unlock the value um, of scandium and rare earths, um, especially for the scandium, since we already gotten it into a sort of a crude form, which is has been upgraded from mineral concentrate. Even in solution, we've been able to upgrade it to certain level. What's left is just to clean up some of the impurities. Um, without going into a lot of details about what we have done, um, I can mention the fact that we've got gotten rid of um, close to 94, 95% of the contained ion. We've separated the rare earths from the scandium itself. Um, aluminum, there's not a whole lot of aluminum in the solution to start with. Um, so what's left is just cleaning up the remaining impurities, uh, a few of them. 
that are left. We're looking at IX for this. We're looking at um, solvent extraction. We may consider other technologies as we move on. Uh, but right now, the focus is to uh, sort of stay on the path of conventional um, metallurgy. I, I don't want to use the word, uh, the word of the shelf because when you're dealing with technology metals, there is nothing of the shelf. Each each um, mineralization will require its own tweaking and its own development. But um, solvent extraction is well known. IX is well practiced, and we think we could make this work. Great, thank you. Now, here's an interesting question. In the press releases, you mostly talk about the TG zone, and I think you've mentioned it throughout the presentation today. What about other zones? Do you think there is still a lot of blue sky potential on the property? Are there plans to explore other zones anytime soon? Before, uh, before Pierre gets in, uh, I'd like to suggest that um, I think he illustrated for you that there were other zones, uh, the hilltop, um, the, the boulder, which we haven't fully developed, uh, the STG zone. And, and what we didn't illustrate for you is there are, is there's a continuation of the magnetic signature uh, south of the, where we've explored that from our view holds very high potential for uh, additional uh, mineralization. We also have found from our recent magnetic survey, uh, parallel anomalies approximately uh, 300 meters into the hang wall or in the instance of most of the targets to the east uh, that we feel very strongly. We have surface indications, certainly from boulder prospecting of the presence of mineralization that's similar to boulder, which is um, a little bit lower scandium grade, but the uh, rare earth grades are quite a bit higher. Uh, in the TG drilling, the average uh, grade is in the, in the order of 0.35 to 0.5% total rare earths. Uh, the Boulder Lake mineralization and these other targets are closer to 1.5%. So I think there's some significant uh, blue sky upside to uh, further oh, resource development on alternative targets on the project. Pierre, would you like um, to uh, would, do yeah. some follow up on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Peter, I mean, you know, yeah, you're exactly right. So uh, I think like, uh, you know, uh, yes, we, uh, you know, in most of our press release, you know, we've been talking a lot about the uh, TGZ uh, zone. Uh, we haven't been talking uh, a lot about the other zones. And the thing is, you know, that's because, you know, uh, you know, we were dealing with uh, budget uh, limitations. And uh, one thing that we had to figure like a uh, very early, so uh, uh, with the uh, with the Crater Lake project was actually, uh, you know, uh, to conduct uh, drilling and get a first uh, resource estimate. And we had to concentrate on what at the time was, uh, you know, uh, our best target, which was a TGZ. But that doesn't take away, you know, uh, the potential from uh, other zones and you know as I mentioned you know uh, uh, we have uh, other zones that you know where actually the can jump grade uh, I mean desire but it's just because of budget limitations you know we had actually to to select the target and uh, and, uh, and I mean get more like uh, I mean the definition trading in a matter to get a resource estimate um a good question. I, I'll combine a few because there were like two questions in Rio Tinto. Um, and well, Peter mentioned the new announcement, but um, their scandium is a byproduct, right? If I'm not mistaken, of titanium waste. Um, yours is different, it's pure bedrock scandium. Um, and a couple of questions related to that. What's the difference in terms of capabilities? Which one is cheaper to produce? Um, is there a difference in quality of the end product? Um, that's that portion of the question. And then do you think the announcement by Rio Tinto, you know, even if the quality is worse, which you're going to address now, um, do you think it's going to help Imperial and other just Scandium projects in general, just because there is a major player in the in the industry now? Um. 
I'll take that and I'll pass it on to Phil at, after that point because he's actually have strategic discussions on uh, consumer use uh, usage and consumer interest in, in the product. Uh, in terms of the quality, I, they're, they're, they're probably equivalent quality to what we're looking at producing for Crater Lake. Uh, but uh, the second part of the question was indeed, it's been helpful to us and that a major has finally put their flag up to suggest that the Scandi market is viable, uh, uh, viable to the point where uh, they, they have, they're getting directly involved with it. Um, in terms of uh, costs, uh, cost structure, uh, we're, we're not exactly familiar with their cost intentions. Um, we can only speculate what their cost uh, price point is going to be. But the bigger issue more than anything else is um, the, their total production level of scandium will be limited by uh, the total titanium production out of their lacteo mine in, uh, in northeastern Quebec. Uh, that will be that will dictate the amount of material that they uh, produce out of that operation, and I think, like anything else I had said earlier, if uh, if you will build it, they will come. Um, their production levels of scandium will be limited; it'd be capped uh, because they're driven by uh, the titanium market for the most part. Uh, it, but ultimately, what what it'll do is open up uh, significant consumer interest and scandium in, uh, incorporation to their uh, to the various uh, manufacturing uh, platforms and uh, for different manufacturing areas. Phil, do you want to uh, have a supplemental comment on that? Sure. Um, I think it's really important for everyone on the call to really understand there's a significant difference with Crater Lake, and that is we are the only primary hard rock source of scandium in North America. By that I mean you're going to do the mineral extraction directly from the ore. Okay. The other thing that makes Crater Lake really unique, and I think I saw someone in chat kind of ask something of a similar question, is that generally scandium is very abundant in the Earth's crust. It does not concentrate. And this is a big difference. The general abundance in the Earth's crust is between, say, 20 and 25 parts per million elemental scandium. That translates into roughly 38 parts per million as an oxide. And as you saw from our presentation, the drill intercepts are very homogeneous and you have a very, very high consistent grade of scandium oxide throughout. This is a defining factor. As we move forward through all of our studies and everything else, we were going to the market to show them that we we're very confident in 1250 to 1500 price point. This in itself is disruptive. Combine that with the potential multi-decade supply that we could potentially continue to expand. And the fact that we're located in the best aluminum ecosystem in North America, this is a win-win-win scenario for people. I cannot emphasize this enough because this is the primary focus that I have when I speak to defense attaches, aerospace and defense people. These are the prime things driving this, especially from a Western geopolitical point of view. That's and I, there well, might have been you know another yeah, I, question I mean, um, yeah, I want to add um, um, a, a point here. If yeah, I want to add a point very quickly on this on this uh, because uh, there was this question of um, cost and you know grade and all of the, all, all of that. Uh, when you look at the primary, I mean the secondary sources of, uh, of scandium, um, be titanium, uh, red mud, uh, uranium, as it is in the former Soviet Union. Uh, you see that most of the most of the um, most of these sources they have between 50 and 100 ppm of, of scandium, and as Peter rightly said, uh, the production from those plants will always be limited by the throughput of the main metal that uh, they're producing. So if it's titanium, the titanium production rate will drive the scandium yield couple with the fact that um, the scandium in their stream, it's low to start with. Um, having said that, I think uh, Rio Tinto getting into the market is very good for the market generally for every scandium, uh, every, you know, scandium uh, aspiring company out there, uh, people who are, who are, you know, exploring for scandium are trying to get into the market. I think it's a good thing. 
And, and I think when the market develop to the level where we think it will, uh, more players will be needed for sure. It's not, it's not a market that Real Tinto alone can, can support with what they have. Great, thank you for that. And I think we'll tie the, the next question into that. Probably Phil and Peter would need to answer that, but um, it's more about the market, global market. What do you, like which customers would you say are your potential customers? And you know, you may paraphrase it a little bit, that was the question, but which industry do you think would be the biggest consumer? you know, end products of scandium aluminum alloy in the near term and long term. Do you are you having any discussions right now? And what are you doing to attract new potential customers? Wow, okay. Yeah. Peter, yeah. you wanna like just a, just a couple of things that you're doing. We know that well, you're doing I, a no, lot. To... Yeah. We've got to be extremely careful about what we say and who are the discussions we're having. But um, okay. suffice it to say uh, that uh, certainly from a margin standpoint, you have to look at m the, what the manufacturer's margins are to give you a sense of what their price ins insensitivity is to end pits of new material. And uh, uh, there are two end, uh, end members. There's the satellite uh, space travel uh, rocketry side of the formula where uh, payload costs are in the order of $54,000 US a kilogram. So any opportunity to reduce weight 20, uh, in other words, 20 kilograms of weight savings uh, equates about a million dollars of payload savings. So uh, they're the least price sensitive, uh, up to $20,000 per kilogram of input costs, which puts us certainly into that market, but it's it's high value, very slow volume. The opposite end of the spectrum is the automotive markets where the margins are quite a bit tighter. Um, they, they cannot tolerate those kinds of prices. It's a much smaller price point. To me, uh, from our perspective, we believe that the automotive industry will benefit from scandium aluminum, but are likely to be late adopters. We think that the middle market uh, aerospace, defense, uh, uh, both uh, commercial and uh, uh, defense jet platforms kind of like sits right in the middle. Uh, we believe that they'll be the first adopters and they're the ones that currently we're targeting. Phil, do you want to supplement that? Sure thing. So let me just harken back to aerospace. This is commercial aerospace. So let's look at the evolution of drones. Let's look at package delivery. Let's look at infrastructures within cities where you're going to have what's called verti ports, where you're going to have them operating concurrently with standard fixed wing or rotary wing aircraft. Currently in a commercial jet, and this price is going to fluctuate a little bit, but if you save a kilogram of weight on a plane and it's in use eight to 10 hours a day for an entire year, that equates into roughly 13,000 US a year in terms of fuel savings. Add to that 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 one kilogram will save you know, roughly 8.6 metric tons of CO2 over its lifespan. These are the initial inputs that are really important to the aerospace sector. The other part is, is that, um, as Peter mentioned, is that price insensitivity. Aerospace is used to paying a premium for performance because it's driven by their product. Now I'd like to juxtapose that and go back to the electric traction motors. The reason that we've called this out as a big application for us is just stop and think about all of the copper demand right now that's been speculated about that's going to go in to feed all of these motors around the world. When you look at even conservative EV projection growth and then look at the number of motors required, it is a staggering number. Even a small percentage of that would be useful for scandium aluminum. Here's how it works. When you look at the cost of copper, which give or take is around $9 right now, and you look at the input of scandium and aluminum, it has to be equivalent or cheaper. With the business modeling that we have done, and it's been very thoroughly vetted, I assure you, we have an equivalent or better price point right now based on our projections. So immediately when you're talking to anyone in the automotive space, the first thing that we calm them down is that the solution is not more expensive than the incumbent technology. 
Secondly, by using the same processes that the incumbent technology requires, you're not charging them operational costs. This is a background cost that would scuttle some potential projects. In this case, it does not, and this is very important. Third, you are reducing potentially half to two thirds of the rotating mass inside the electric motor. That translates generally in, uh, directly into range, and that translates into acceleration. And I've driven a Tesla, and I tell you, I love the acceleration. I can't wait to try one with a Scandium electric wire. Okay, I will add that in terms of the business development, you can ask Peter, we have been on this throughout the COVID crisis. Zoom has become our best friend. We are looking at face-to-face -face direct marketing where it's gonna be safe and appropriate. I can assure you that the trade commissioners for Canada know all about what we're doing. The Critical Minerals Task Force that's headed by NRCAN, we are in touch with them on a continual basis. And most importantly, we have something that was just published by the US government. I urge everyone on the call today to go read up the 100 day critical mineral report published by the White House, White House in June. It speaks very clearly about the geopolitical risk, the issues to supply. And when you look at the minerals that the US is 100% reliant on, you can check a lot of boxes for Crater Lake because we are there. And look too at the recommendations and seeing what the White House report is saying needs to be done for North American and European supply chains. Tesla's uh, stock may be going up after this webinar, Phil. You know, you did, you've done them a favor. Uh, but it's only, um, it's only if they buy the scandium <laughs> aluminum wire from us. Oh, that's that's true. Only only that we will tweet it out only after they they purchase some scandium. Um, we're nearing the end of the uh, of the forum webinar, but I will leave you with one question that you know I, I think Peter should answer to wrap it up. But I just want to mention that we still have some questions that haven't been answered, and I think they're good questions. We're just kind of running out of time. Um, and we will collect those questions and we will answer them separately, you know, in an email. And I, I would like to thank everybody for being so, you know, engaging. And obviously we have this panel um, expert here. Thanks everybody for your contribution. And we would like to finish with, with this question for Peter, where Peter kind of wraps it up to say what's happening right now, what's really important that's going on with Imperial and what would be the near term catalysts and you know, milestones that you um, that you're approaching, that you expect to hit very soon, that you think will drive the share price up. Thanks, Irina. Uh, certainly, we've got a number of them. Uh, we've been quite active uh, in disseminating media on our exp exploration and development activities. Uh, upcoming uh, by the end of this month is uh, at least the recording of the resource report. Uh, the final report won't be available for another 45 days, but we'll be in a position to report out uh, the resource estimate for the drilling that uh, Pierre undertook on the TG zone. Um, we're about to mobilize uh, this summer uh, for the program that Pierre outlined to you. In other words, uh, additional prospecting uh, we've got uh, extra drilling both on the TG and some of the alternative targets to the south. So we'll be in the position to report that out throughout the summer and fall. Um, the, the collection of the bulk sample and the commencement of the pilot plant work by Yemi uh, later this year will be, will be announced, certainly. Uh, and from Phil's perspective, uh, we have a number of strategic discussions with uh, consumers and certainly uh, R&D partners uh, to develop a market pull from the creation of new alloys and uh, new, new applications for scandium aluminum. Uh, so that'll take us way right up into, I would say the beginning of 2022. Uh, um, uh, we should be in a position probably by the fall to report the results of our PEA, the preliminary economic assessment, by virtue of the fact that we will have in hand the resource report We'll have the final outline of the metallurgical uh, flow sheet that uh, uh, Yemi, Yemi Oidarin is uh, currently developing. And we'll, we'll be in the process of undertaking a strategic marketing study. And those three inputs are critical for the PEA. And, and uh, the intention there is to report the PEA in, uh, 
uh, in the fall or uh, certainly late in 2021. So quite active. Great. And from my perspective, Imperial Mining is a very exciting story. Scandium is a very exciting commodity and CHF Capital Markets is extremely excited to be working with Imperial, um, you know, on getting the story uh, out to a larger audience. Thanks uh, everybody who attended